You know, it's always a... I was struck by how you know, sunny and beautiful it is outside, and then we come inside and talk about such dark topics. <laughs> sort of a little bit of a theme, and I, I'm no exception to that rule. I'm going to talk about whether the uh, sort of great guardian of free speech and expression, uh, the example once to the world that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution has uh, become obsolete, uh, is no longer uh, up to the challenge, and uh, whether it's become sort of a bystander in what I think many of us would agree is a, a dark age or golden age, depending how you see it, of efforts to discredit the press, efforts to attack and humiliate journalists, efforts uh, to lie and propagandize um, from, from multiple quarters, um, uh, deliberate efforts to, to uh, use false speech to try to sway elections, uh, both by a domestic government and, frankly, by foreign governments targeting the United States. Um, you know, I think most of us agree that these are uh, not the best of developments, and, and the question I'm going to ask is, uh, you know, what, uh, where is the, the First Amendment? Um, so the basic premise of my talk is that the First Amendment um, was basically created or, or came to life in conditions that are very different than today's, in a speech environment, in the media environment, that was in two or three ways fundamentally uh, different, and that it was in some sense crafted for an older set of challenges, and is having trouble dealing what, with what are new forms of censorship and speech control that have showed up over the last uh, uh, five, five years or so. Now, I'll make this argument in more detail, but let me give you the basics of it. Uh, the premise is that the First Amendment was fundamentally born uh, to deal uh, with the idea of government arresting speakers and dissidents uh, and, 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 uh, and censoring the males as its primary uh, threat. It assumed and still assumes that speech was scarce uh, that it was expensive uh, to, to try to speak to the public, and that the major threat to speech would always be uh, criminal action by the government. Now, that was uh, true, and we're going to talk about uh, when the First Amendment developed, when the First Amendment, uh, in the, especially in the 1920s and, and, and thereafter, but this thing has happened, um, sometimes we call it the internet, uh, you know, there's been a transformation, uh, social media uh, is, a, is one of the main channels of, of how we receive information. And that has caused a fundamental shift in our media environments, in how information flows, in how we, we learn information that has both changed the challenges for free speech and also cause an adaptation in what censors or political speech controllers do when they want to control speech. And you know, I'm going to detail some of this as, as we go on, but uh, the fundamental change, uh, I'd said earlier that the First Amendment was based on the premise that speech was scarce, that it was expensive uh, you know, to, to operate a newspaper or even hand out pamphlets. Um, today we live in an environment where speech is cheap, where it is abundant, where it's, it's very, uh, in, where, where the fundamental challenge is no longer uh, finding speakers, but rather finding attention for speech. In other words, there's been a, a fundamental shift in what is scarce. It used to be speech that was scarce, and now it is attention that is scarce. You may have experienced this in your own life. <laughs> you may find that you're not exactly craving information, but trying to dig your way out of information. Um, you have met, may have had the experience where, you know, for example, you have the idea you're gonna go to your computer and, and maybe write one email, and suddenly three or four hours have gone by, and you've read like a thousand random things about different celebrities or random stories or what crazy thing Trump did today or whatever, and you're like, where did that time go? That, that, that is our environment. It's very different, I think, than, than previous uh, media environments where even getting information was hard, um, where there was, was such a thing as being bored, which I think I almost forgot what that feels like. So 
let me, let me go through the argument in a little more, more detail now. That's my basic approach. And uh, as I've said, I think that there has been an adaptation to these environments by censors, but that the law has not kept up. Um, I'm going to tell a story wherein we see that Russia and China, two countries that were very intent on making sure that their control over speech survived the internet revolution, were really the pioneers of the new techniques of speech control. We're really the, the masterminds who figured out how do you control speech in the internet era. And they did so with the invention of two critical techniques, somewhat based on older techniques, um, the, the so-called troll army uh, approach to controlling speech and what we will describe as flooding or reverse censorship, which is the technique of putting so much information into the environment that you win the battle for intention. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into the, the structure of, of this argument. So I've said that um, the First Amendment was um, uh, created in a different times for different conditions. And uh, many of you start, may start of thinking about the framing, uh, you know, the, the founding of the Constitution, the writing of the B Bill of Rights, 1791. Uh, some of you may know a little more about the First Amendment, but I'll, I'll tell you if you're, you know, something that many Americans are surprised to learn, which is that the First Amendment was a dead letter for most of American history. The First Amendment did nothing um, yeah, until really the first signs of life in the 1920s, and really only became active in the 1950s through 60s. So it's one of these ancient American traditions uh, like the Super Bowl, that turns out not to really be that old at all. It's like you know, it's a couple couple of decades. In fact, it's it, it's important to think of that because it's actually a fragile tradition. Um, you know, if, even until the 30s and 40s, you could be arrested in the United States for for espousing communism. Even in the early days, uh, right right after the writing of the Constitution, they said all this stuff. People were thrown in prison for for criticizing the federal government. So the idea of America as a particularly speech tolerant, speech upholding place is, is really something that has to do with, with the last latter parts of the 20th century. And I think that's important, because it suggests we could lose it. <laughs> suggests we could go back to the way the things uh, used to be. So um, let me give you some evidence that, uh, frankly, things weren't always as, as we thought. In 1791, um, Congress uh, and the states ratified the Bill of Rights, which obviously has the First Amendment as the, as the, uh, at the head of it. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, just seven years later, uh, Congress passes the uh, Sedition Act of, seven, uh, of 1798, signed by President John Adams, who's otherwise usually a pretty good guy, but I got in this one, he really blew it. Um, and uh, I mean, I kind of look up, he kind of stands for virtue and stuff, but he signs this law that makes it a crime to, to, to criticize the federal government. This is only seven years after the Bill of Rights. And, and they go out and they prosecute people for criticizing the federal government. The, the excuse was, well, we're kind of in war with France, um, even though they were our allies early. Now we're at war, and you know, we've got to do this. So here's one example I was looking up. Uh, there was a fellow named uh, Matthew Leon uh, from Vermont. And so here's what he said about the administration. Uh, he said it was uh, an administration of ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish, selfish avarice. I said that wrong, but... So he, he was prosecuted in prison for four months. He was a congressman. <laughs> he was put in prison for four months for criticizing the administration. So that's the early Bill of Rights tradition. It's not much of a tradition. Now, to be sure, there were people who thought this was wrong. Madison and, and Jeff, uh, Thomas Jefferson didn't, didn't think this was uh, an appropriate use of government power. But it's still striking that you had these prosecutions upheld by courts, you know, right around the Bill, Bill of Rights. And then you have a great silence, um, you know, not a lot of activation. And the real founding period of, of the First Amendment, where it got its ideas, where it really all started was in the 1920s um, and in reaction to some of the uh, censorship that showed up around the First uh, World War. And you have to, to it, it is these three judges in particular, very famous judges, learned hand, uh, Louis Brandeis, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who kickstart the whole thing. So, so, so they're really the founders of the First Amendment tradition in the United States. Uh, and they were very uh, courageous and, and, and bold uh, in what they did. They, they brought it to life. It's kind of a good lesson in, in, you know, in how constitutional law works. It does take these, these moments where justices have to react uh, 
and, and assert what they think is right to really change things. Um, I should say for all those justices, all of them were committed to majoritarian rule. It was difficult for them to come around to it, but it, it was the uh, actions of the United States during the First World War that I think made them feel it was just too much. Um, I think sometimes it's important, you know, as we are in these times where we think about whether the United States is getting more extreme, nationalistic, um, even, you know, edging upon fascist tendencies, um, it's not completely alien to this country. Uh, in uh, the First World War, uh, you had a, uh, uh, an executive agency uh, named the Committee for Public Information run by a guy named George Creel. Um, and its basic idea, this is during World War I, is that there should not be dissent in the United States when it came to the war, or frankly, almost anything. And I'll read you a quote of, this is like the top, uh, you know, propaganda official for the United States in World War I. Um, he said, uh, the war will, the will to win of a democracy depends on the degree of which every one of the people in the democracy can concentrate and consecrate body and soul and spirit in the supreme effort of service and sacrifice. We need to weld the people of the United States into one white hot mass insect instinct with fraternity, devotion, courage, and deathless determination. You know, it sounds almost, I was comparing this to, to some of uh, uh, Mussolini's speech at the same time, not much different. This idea of this sort of supreme will that overcomes individual uh, uh, decision making, individual uh, capacities, and welds the whole country into one will. You know, we sort of had this. So eventually, uh, and, and you know, there, that was the spirit. Uh, a new sedition was at, act was passed during the First World War, and um, it was used pretty pretty roughly. Uh, some of you may know the story, but uh, Eugene Debs was the uh, founder of the American Socialist Party. Uh, he was running for for president in in 1918, and uh, you know he gave a speech where he said um, uh, he basically said that everyone who opposes the war is being treated like a criminal. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you the quote. Uh, he says, the brand of treason is being applied to men who dare to even whisper their opposition to the war. And then he, he spoke to this audience in Ohio, in Canton, Ohio, and he said, um, you know, mostly workers, uh, you are fit for something better than slavery and cannon fodder. You need to know that you were not created to work and to produce and impoverish yourself to enrich an idle explorer. You need to know that you have a mind to improve, a soul to develop, and a manhood to sustain. So he gives a speech, you know, sort of discouraging uh, people, uh, just obviously not very favorable for the war, but the U.S. attorney was in the, uh, in the audience. Debs was uh, indicted, convicted, sentenced for 10 years just for giving a speech against the war, uh, interfering with the draft, um, and it was upheld unanimously by the Supreme Court, including all these guys, including Justice Holmes, uh, including Justice Brandeis. So this is an... So I think it was those kind of things, and most scholars agree, that some of these guys started saying, you know, this, this isn't, there's something not right with this. You know, it doesn't really seem <laughs> consistent with the spirit of American liberty that you can give a speech, uh, you know, in opposition to the war, I mean, prison for 10 years. Um, and so each of them, in their own ways, uh, started, uh, came up, and this is really the founding of the First Amendment tradition. Um, uh, you have Holmes, uh, his opinion, uh, Abrams, uh, putting out the idea of, the, of, of a marketplace of ideas and, and time overturns every fighting faith. Uh, Brandeis, uh, I, I'm a big, uh, I'm a, a devotee of Louis Brandeis. Uh, I've become that way um, for a lot of reasons. And, and Brandeis's um, conception of the First Amendment uh, had to do with the idea of citizenship uh, in a republic requiring a kind of liberty to speak your mind to try and find out what you really believe. And he believed that, you know, if you live in a time where you're so afraid of being uh, arrested for speaking your mind, you couldn't become the kind of citizen deserved of the United States. You know, it's even just exploring, trying on things, figuring out what you think, that you develop the kind of character you need to, to keep a republic going, as opposed to mindlessly listening to whatever opinions are thrown at you, you know, and feeling you have to be welded into that white mass instinct with national pride or whatever. So, uh, yeah, Brand Brandeis, so they, these are and the problem with this stuff, actually, in some ways, is that it's so good. <laughs> these old opinions are so great, they're like watching The Godfather or something. You can't imagine anything could be better. You kind of feel like they solved the problem forever. And I think that is a little bit of our problem with the First Amendment tradition, uh, it, that it's so great that we can't, or it's, so, it's hard to contemplate uh, 
that our conditions uh, may have changed. So let's uh, zoom forward uh, to the 2010s. I'll say a little bit more. Let me say one last thing about the first the free speech tradition. What Brandeis, Learned Hand, and Holmes were saying was in dissent. It really wasn't until the 50s that you started to have a kind of a true First Amendment tradition. There's even cases of 30s, 40s, people still being arrested for advocating communism, you know, being against the war effort. So you don't really have it uh, until you, you start uh, having the real protections of the, uh, of the war in court. So that's the tradition. Um, let's fast forward uh, to, 2010s, and we have a uh, speech environment transformed by the internet. Now, it's easy to say, uh, you know, there was an internet revolution, everything changed, but I want to be a little more precise about what did change when it came to how we, the public, uh, receive uh, information. I said this early, but the easiest way to understand it, uh, is something actually a professor named Eugene uh, Volokh said, is that the internet made speech cheap it made it uh, easy for anyone to at least put their ideas out there. The flip side, and the thing I don't think we completely understood at the time was, or, or even now, was that a natural consequence of making speech cheap and abundant was to make human attention scarce and valuable. Um, maybe it's no surprise, again, I'll turn to your own life. Do you find that even throughout your own day, there's maybe hundreds, maybe even a thousand efforts to try to get at your attention? That, you know, it seems that most of the media technologies we use feel kind of addictive. Where, where's my phone? I just, this is a very attentive audience, actually. You know, if I sometimes give talkers to, 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 to young, you know, maybe it's my fault, but sometimes younger audiences, I think some people cannot control themselves, cannot sit through an entire speech. And it's partially, I think, because there is this incredible value now of human attention, and any way you can get part of it is, is, is the business model. And this has affected, and I think transformed, our political speech environment um, in fundamental ways, um, some, of some of which I'll describe. But maybe I'll just put one up there, is that almost everything in our political speech environment has become a contest for attention. Maybe I'll point to someone who's particularly good at this. His name is President Trump, once candidate Trump. Do you remember how there'd be these debates, uh, Republican and Republican debates, and everyone would say, oh my God, you know, Trump really lost that debate. It was Terry didn't say all these dumb things. But everything was about Trump. <laughs> and 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 I think that Trump has this real genius understanding of the importance of attention as kind of the uber value, more important than truth, more important than almost than the message, just making sure everyone is receiving your information at all times, that that is, that is the essential <laughs> crucial moment. I, I wish that was a punchline, but not really funny <laughs> enough. But yeah, and, and that, that's, that's, an old, that's kind of an old lesson, but I think it's a lesson of our times, is, is that one of the transformations is that everything is about winning the battle for attention. Unfortunately, I have to say this also makes the opposition to, to anyone who gathers attention, Trump in particular, in some ways feed the fire, right? Because it moves even more attention, more attention. Everything becomes around one person's agenda and what they have to say. And uh, anyway, so I'll talk about that. But I want to talk, that's a, the transformation. But I want to talk in particular how this has transformed censorship and speech control in our times. So here it is, 2010s, and as I said earlier, you had um, two governments in particular who were very concerned about the fact that the internet would erode their control over speech and, and public discourse. And I mean here particularly the Russian and, and Chinese governments. Now, there were some countries um, whose reaction to the internet, like North Korea, was relatively simple. They just didn't turn it on, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't let it, uh, and uh, other, a couple um, Middle Eastern regimes, extremely censorial. But uh, countries like Russia and China, they wanted to be part of things. They wanted, in fact, China in particular wanted to start to, to have um, uh, a healthy, ha you know, have an industry of, of internet companies was very successful. So just turning off the internet wasn't going to work. Um, so China, over, over about a 10-year period, maybe 15 years, 
developed very sophisticated ways of trying to control the speech environment. Um, the, er the earliest uh, approaches taken by China were, were relatively straightforward. They, they blocked, continued to block many, many sites, so you know, like Wikipedia or, or uh, Facebook and so forth. Um, so that was one series of approaches. Um, they uh, have the other technique, the old school, which is um, arresting dissidents, particularly prominent dissidents, so that, that's another thing. But China soon came to the realization, Chinese propaganda officials, that they, they didn't want to arrest everybody. So now there's cheap speech. Anyone can say something. Anyone got on a board. They didn't want to arrest everybody. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the arrests, particularly of you know, otherwise innocent people, tended to themselves generate a lot of attention and, and outrage. And so they started competing. And we said the whole battle is about rage. So when you arrest someone, you sort of make them into a celebrity. And they, they didn't like that. So instead, they, they started to think the real uh, technique for these times is not to heavily suppress, but instead to flood all the channels of information with, with pro-government uh, sentiment. So the most straightforward way they, they, they did this was they just began hiring people to be pro-government, just write stuff that, that was good. So they, they, they created this thing called the um, uh, Five Cent Army, or the people were paid something equivalent of five cents to post pro-governmental messages. In one year, I think there were, I might get this number wrong, 458 million social media posts generated by this, this army of people who are just constantly saying, no, 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 you know, the government's got the right side on this. I think that person's wrong. And so anytime you say something, like this army of people comes and disagrees with you, and what you end up seeing mostly is the pro-government stuff. And then the pro-government people forward, the pro-government propaganda, blah, blah, blah. And so instead, you work in a very different way to control the speech environment. Sometimes it's called reverse censorship. Instead of cramping down, you just, you know, you drown it out. And so maybe there's a few dissenting voices, but they, they don't really uh, get heard. Uh, Mixed in with this are techniques of discrediting uh, dissenters, discred saying you know they don't know what they're talking about or, or saying bad things, which starts to lead to the, the Russian techniques. So the Russians, um, same, same sort of challenge. They want to be in, in control. The approaches are a little more, are more brutal. Um, so China, uh, not China, Russia pioneered the idea of web censorship, web control, as an as aspect of its sort of more military uh, propaganda uh, efforts. They, starting in the early 2000s, they began organizing something called the, the Web Brigade, uh, which was, you know, has sort of our martial metaphor, um, and uh, later called the Troll Army, which was you know, thousands of people who were um, employed to use the internet uh, to attack humiliate and try to destroy uh, foes of the Putin government, either at home in, in, in Russia or overseas when there was a, a matter of, of controversy uh, that they wanted to, to do something about. So, and the way they did this, um, you know, may has become familiar to us, which is, um, well, really two. One is to personally just flood the speaker with, with attacks and death threats and you know, their, their bosses and everyone who knows them to say it's a bad person and we're gonna do all these horrible things to you just to make, personally make it painful to, to speak in opposition to government, right? You see horrible images of your children being, you know, raped or chopped into pieces and all kinds, just horrible stuff. So you personally put a, you personally hurt the person who's speaking. And the other is to spread vicious lies about the, the, the person who you wanna criticize. Um, this is a technique actually pioneered by the British in World War I. A lot of bad things happened in World War I. Uh, known, and it, at the time, was known as atrocity propaganda. So you just come up with things that suggest the person is you know, sexual deviant, or they uh, abuse children, or they are involved in you know, satanic or horrible uh, religion, or you know, something about them is abhorrent. And as soon as you hear it, you would, would, would hate this, this person. Um, I guess you can start to guess uh, these techniques uh, have come to the United States. <laughs> and it's not hard to see um, the use of atrocity propaganda, it's also known as fake news, uh, in, in the United States, particularly during the 2016 cycle. And since that time, um, and I guess the, the bigger story is that these two techniques of censorship, um, the flooding technique uh, 
and the uh, uh, Russian uh, troll army technique have come to the United States and uh, the First Amendment, which is still kind of waiting for someone to arrest someone with a pamphlet, is just sitting on the sidelines, like, oh, okay, e even though there's these new, new techniques. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's well documented, uh, the, 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 the troll army techniques in particular uh, in, in the United States, uh, continuing and particularly targeting 2016 election. Um, I've said that it's typical to, um, to uh, tr uh, accuse people of atrocities. Uh, you know, Hillary, there was all these stories surrounding Hillary Clinton. Um, there were, I mean, they were just right straight from the textbook. There was some series of stories about how she was involved in satanic rituals and some kind of, based on very, very weird evidence. Um, there was obviously this Pizzagate pedophilia ring that people, people know about. So, you know, it's basically the exact same textbook. You just come up with these things and accuse the, the people. And then somehow, you know, most of it may seem ridiculous, but uh, it, over time, it, uh, these things have, have had an unfortunate tendency uh, to stick. Um, and then the other approach that you see uh, dramatically, very well documented, uh, is the level of harassment, humiliation, and attacks that journalists have, have come under uh, since, uh, since about 2015 or so, particularly when you know, they criticize the alt-right or become critics of, 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 of President Trump or candidate Trump, um, just say, a kind of thing, you know, and, and journalists are tough and they can kind of put up with it, but there definitely are people who think like, do I really want to get into political reporting if it means I have death threats on my answering machine every day? And maybe at some level, I, you know, these things work. You know, I think it, people are like, well, the path of least resistance is maybe I'll, I'll become a business reporter or something like that. I, I, I think it's a, a serious issue and it's only because we do have a very brave press corps that uh, uh, we continue to have a resistance. So, um, so these are the uh, uh, problems. I, I believe, I guess I'll restate my thesis for the third time, that we are experiencing efforts to censor and control speech in the United States and to manipulate elections for which our traditional apparatus, the free speech, uh, the First Amendment is not well prepared. And I think one danger for us, and it goes back again to how just great the core of the First Amendment is, is that because sometimes if you think you have something figured out, it gets in the way of, 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 of thinking about how you might have to change it, right? We have this wonderful tradition and the, the finest uh, and best kind of ideals of America expressed in the First Amendment. The idea that maybe it's not meeting our challenges is hard, to, hard to, to stomach. So let me talk about what I think needs to change and um, I'm gonna try and leave some, some time for, for questions. Um, so it's not an easy, easy problem. Um, you know, the First Amendment was designed uh, uh, to facilitate more speech, but more speech is not our problem right now. Um, but here are two ideas which I think could, could be important. Um, first of all, I think that we have to start talking not just about the duty to prevent government um, from censoring speakers, but the duty of government to protect the main channels of expression. And let, let, me, let me say what I mean by this. Um, so there is a, a tradition in, in American constitutional law, First Amendment law, that says that the First Amendment creates not just rights, but certain duties. And among those duties is the duty to protect speakers. And I'll, I'll tell you where this, this idea came from. So in the 1960s, um, controversial time. Sometimes, uh, you know, there would be a, a group of speakers, um, um, you know, maybe opposed to the war, maybe marching for civil rights, and sometimes they'd be confronted by, by an angry mob, you know. Maybe they start throwing rocks at them, maybe they'd, they'd you know, come at them. And the question is, well, what are the, what is the duty of the police in those situations? What is the police supposed, is the police supposed to do? Now, sometimes the police would arrest the protesters. Like, that can't be right, said Justice Black. You know, it can't be just because people oppose what you're saying that they get to, to, to heckle you and have the police arrest you to, to create a... So uh, Justice Black, uh, I think most movingly, said that the first duty of the police has to be to protect the values of the First Amendment, have to, has to be to defend unpopular, even despised speakers, and give them their right to speak. 
Um, and I think that we need to translate this principle into the internet era. I think that the, uh, the law enforcement, U.S. attorneys, um, even maybe parts of our uh, security apparatus, need to understand that there are both foreign domestic efforts to attack the American electoral process, to attack the channels of free speech, and that, that these should be understand, understood as the crimes that they are and should be prosecuted vigorously. In other words, I think that um, anyone who makes it their business to go around making death threats to journalists who they don't agree with them should be in prison. That that is a crime to constantly go around harassing uh, the press and, and trying to make them afraid to do their job. That, you know, it's clear that uh, under the First Amendment you can punish true threats, threats of violence. And there are people who are out there just trying to silence and, and harass the press. And that should become an enforcement priority. Uh, it's not right now. There is one uh, fellow who has uh, done a little bit of, on this. His name is Robert Mueller, the special counsel. And I think he, he is an example for everyone. He, he indicted 13 of the Russians uh, that they could identify who were involved in trying to attack the uh, election structure and, and manipulate speech in, in, in the United States. And I think that should be the model. So one big uh, part of the reinvigoration of the First Amendment, I think, is the recognition of, of law enforcement duties. Uh, a second, um, and this one is less original, uh, has to do with, with um, private solution to the problems. And here I'm talking to the main tech platforms. So, you know, I, I uh, love the tech platforms. I uh, spent some time in Silicon Valley and my uh, misspent youth, and um, they kind of blundered into the news business by accident, you know. I, I think that uh, if you think of something like Google News, someone was probably just like, hey, look at that, cool, there's some more information, let's, uh, you know, have something called Google News. Uh, you know, Facebook, um, similarly, uh, started itself as a, as a way of sharing information, and people sometimes share news, and it turned out that uh, f fake news sometimes shares better than, than real news, and Facebook's designed to try to uh, algorithmically make you see stuff you want to see, and so they got into the business not only of uh, being a major news distributor, but also being a, a major channel for fake news distribution and, and Russian propaganda efforts. So I'm not the first to say this, but it, um, it's long overdue for these media, for these tech platforms, uh, despite having blundered in, to, to accept the duties of, of being uh, uh, what they are, which is part of the media, or part of the ways in which people in this de democratic republic receive information. And information that's not just random or, you know, having to do with cats, but having to do with collective self-government. You know, that, that, that this, is, this is it. I mean, we're in the big leagues here. We're deciding how this country is to be governed. And um, it's not easy, the task of collective self-government. It takes, I mean, going back to Brandeis, it takes citizens who are educated and most of all who are well-informed. And um, the responsibility of how we get informed right now has a lot to do with how we get information, which has a lot to do with the platform. So th those sort of duties of, of civic responsibility really need to under be undertaken. And it's hardly impossible. Um, you know, the outlets um, that, um, uh, you know, there's companies and, and outfits that are, you know, figuring out who are the outlets that, you know, publish news that is actually not deserved of the label news, but is, you know, propaganda of one kind or another or deliberately false, and either market or even offer people the option of, uh, you know, fake news free, free uh, information. Uh, you know, they've kind of made some moves in this direction. Uh, I think there's uh, sometimes concerns about the business model, but, you know, this is more important than any country, than any little business model or something like that. This is about, you know, the future of democracy, and we're sort of supposed to be the example here to the world. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is um, uh, something that private action is, is required for. So uh, that's, uh, I, I want to leave some time for questions, but that, that's what I want to talk about. Um, you know, I, I think we can take some inspiration from, from Brandeis Homes and, and, and Learn a Hand. Uh, they, they were facing... Uh, a situation like ours, where there was a lot of extremism, um, where it seemed that there was nothing to be done, they had they had a lot of courage. They thought about the First Amendment in, in new ways, and I think we need to accept that challenge ourselves. I, I said it before, but I do think we are. Countries do go through pivotal moments, 
nothing uh, can be taken for granted. You know, respectable democratic republics have turned to, to fascism and extremism that lasts for a very long time. It's difficult to recover from. So this is a you know, sort of essential time to start at one part of the problem. There's a lot of parts of this problem, but one of it is getting the media and news environment right, uh, understanding it as an instrument of self-government, and understanding that what we see and what we hear and what we absorb will ultimately become what we believe and ultimately become how we decide to steer this enormous ship called the United States. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your time and attention. So I was told to, to um, if people have questions to wait for the, the mic to reach them. Oh, I guess I'll pick people. Uh, look, oh, it looks like she, I'm sorry, I guess she's. Uh, um, Mike Signer um, from Charlottesville. Question for you about the standards that have come down to us on um, limiting speech from like Brandenburg, Brandenburg versus Ohio, uh -huh. um, Nazis versus Skokie case. Um, Imminent, an incitement and imminent unlawful action is the test, or a lot of time in pub, for public governments, it's a credible threat. Mm -hmm. So it's a very high standard to meet. And do you think that standard has to be changed or evolved in any way? You mean in order to, for part one of the program I was trying to describe? Right. No, I don't think so, um, because that's, um, I don't, I, I've gone through some of the, this is gonna get a little lawyerly, but you know, having reading the cases, uh, the First Amendment, as we have it, has made adequate room for punishing people who, who stalk, threaten, and um, uh, harass uh, journalists. And you know, th th the situation you're talking to is sort of when can you put down a, a, a speaker who's igniting, getting a crowd ready to, to fight you know, with, with strong words. That's slightly different than the jurisprudence surrounding threats themselves. And you know, a threats or, or um, uh, cons conspiracies, a solicitation of crimes, all these things fall into a slightly different category. And I, don't, I think it's easily within our current framework. Frankly, I think it's m mainly a matter of prosecutorial discretion. You know, so much of what kind of country we live in is what, what crimes people think are important. And I don't think U.S. prosecutors or, or state attorney generals you know, are particularly focused on this. They see it as, well, you know, just, just talk. But I think that um, repairing our speech system starts with uh, prosecuting major threats to the channels. I also think it has an international dimension as well, as, as I mentioned. Uh, there's, there's a gentleman here. Oh, here, oh sure, okay, so I think she's speaking, the, she's choosing the speakers, thanks. Uh, Victoria Smith, How do you, do? you might not know, but Harry Blackman used to come here every summer oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and speak to the Justice and Society group. And after the, in 1992, after the St. Paul case yeah. was decided, the Supreme Court found that it was an illegal regulation of speech to prosecute uh, cross burning. Yeah. All nine justices had different reasons. <laughs> and Blackman said, do not quote me on this. And I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't understand what the First Amendment is, right. clearly from that case. Do you think the justices sitting now are any different than that group? <laughs> I, so I had sort of focused on the Supreme Court's uh, writings in the 20s uh, through the 70s because those are the ones I agree with the most. Um, <laughs> I, 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 if you ask me, I think the First Amendment has actually wandered uh, off from its, I think the main job of the First Amendment is, is protecting and trying to ensure a healthy speech environment around, particularly surrounding political speech. And it's kind of wandered in some strange directions. Um, it's a you know, well-known case where uh, the Supreme Court found the selling of private data for advertising to be a form of speech. Obviously, people know about Citizens United. So I, I think the, my, my broader thesis is that the First Amendment has gone on a frolic and a detour, and it's kind of lost sight of its main, main goals and main duties, which is the, the speech environment of the United States. So yes, I think this, and, and the thing is, the current justices they, you know, kind of think of themselves as really strong defenders of the First Amendment. Most of what they're doing is not core to the First Amendment's agenda. Most of it is more about, essentially about corporate speech rights and advertising rights, which I, I think are at best, uh, let's say, a, a detour from, 
the original purpose. Uh, <clears throat> Bart Winokur from Philadelphia. Uh, your discussion of Facebook and Google actually takes one back to when newspapers first came into the country and were a new way of dispensing information. Today, the law of newspapers is if I write a letter to the New York Times and they publish it, they are responsible if I have a libel in there or if right. I have a threat. When you think of that development of the law, and you think of what's going on with the internet, we currently have a battle between people who believe you should be able to say anything, any place. And on the other hand, those who believe, and I think the law will go this way, that those who are, in effect, curating the information, mm -hmm. who are deciding what you and I ought to read, much as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal do, are ultimately going to be subject to those same rules. I think that's what's going to happen, and I think that's the direction you're talking about. Yeah, so the gentleman's referring to the fact that uh, most of the online platforms have sort of a blanket immunity to, to libel or defamation laws um, if, uh, for, for the stuff they, that appears in their site. Now, you know, there was some re good reasons for that, I, I, I think, particularly in the 90s. Um, it seemed very challenging. Uh, you know, if you think about every YouTube video that's ever been posted or everything, and so they thought, well, you can't even get a start with this. But I, I, there, has, there is some discussion as whether, as you said, when it's very curated, when you're actively aware of what's going on, do, do, should you enjoy the same immunities? And particularly when you call something, some, something uh, news or you present it in a certain way. Um, I, I want to focus on one thing around journalism. You know, journalists get a lot of uh, uh, grief, but journalistic ethics were hard won. And, uh, you know, the tech industry could, could take some lessons uh, from them. Um, you know, it's sort of understood if you're in journalism uh, that you don't print rumors. If you're re in real journalism, right? You don't print, journalists are always getting hearing rumors. You know, so-and-so is an illegitimate child. So-and-so is an affair with so-and-so. So-and-so uh, is going to do this or, you know, secretly was a member. You hear that all the time. Um, and obviously, rumors are pretty interesting. I mean, most of us like hearing rumors. You're kind of wondering, well, who has an illegitimate child? That kind of sounds like, I mean, you know, most of us are interested. So, you know, a newspaper can make a lot of, it, it's tempting. It's always been tempting since the birth of journalism to say, like, all right, let's just print this stuff. We're not really sure it's true, but, you know, it could be, and people want to read it. But, you know, responsible newspapers don't do that. That was hard won. Basically, tech platforms just ignore that. They, 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 well, they sort of stumbled into it and then say, hey, this stuff is getting a lot of clicks. Um, and, you know, part of what we're, we're talking about uh, is in some sense restoring the idea of journalistic ethics uh, to, a, to a broader range of, of organizations that are now in the business of media. Stefan Edlis, uh, thank you for explaining how tough it was in the 20s and 30s. I think we have more free speech now than we've had in a long time. Anybody who's watched Bill Maher mocking the president will agree with that. Uh, and just a specific, what you, what's your attitude to those 13, Rus those 13 Russian trolls? I, as I understand, uh, they are not entitled to see the evidence against them. Um, so I do think that uh, we've made strides forward, as, as I said. I think it's very, the core freedom to speak and criticize government without being arrested is pretty important. If we lose that, we're in a much worse uh, position. But I, I also think we're not... Even though we, we have that, that right, we shouldn't ignore the ways in which it, speech is, tries to be controlled otherwise. Uh, for example, by you know, flooding, flood, flooding uh, the channels with pro-government information, uh, attacking, attacking, pr having private armies who attack or private people who attack journalists who criticize the president. I mean, you might not be arrested, but you could be hounded and, and, and uh, insulted and, and, um, and threatened, and I think those are not, not pleasant things. As for the 13 Russians, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm sure if, if they are, you know, to set foot on American soil or become captured somehow, I think eventually they'll be, be shown the evidence against it. You know, Mueller's not, um, he's a regular U.S. prosecutor, but I think that he sets a model. I do believe we should be cracking down on people who are deliberately trying to, um, uh, uh, and trying to uh, disrupt or corrupt the electoral processes in the United States and to hurt, the feature, confuse, uh, disorient, basically destroy American democracy that those people should be prosecuted. 
I'm Ben Benson, and thank you. Sure. My question is, where is, do you have in your mind a definition of fake news? And, here, and here's my question. If I threaten you, we have laws against that. If I say things about you that are not true, and I know they're not true, we have laws to prevent that. Mm -hmm. What if I pass on information that's not true, but I don't know it's not true? Mm -hmm. Or what if you and I disagree about what the assumptions are? We agree on the facts, we disagree on the forecast or the implications. Where is, is there a definition of where fake news begins and ends? Yes, yeah, so that's a, good, uh, a good, good question. So let me make two things very clear. So first of all, this campaign I said of, of protecting the main speech channels uh, against threats uh, and, and violent and de deliberate corruption, that, that does not actually extend it to the fake news. I don't think fake news sh should be, uh, you know, someone who says something that's a lie should be prosecuted. I don't think that's true. So it may, may be clear what I want to talk about is, is ethics. So what, what, where would I go with, you know, what defines uh, fake news? I think it's a question of intent. <laughs> you know, what, I think it is so, you know, information which is designed uh, with a deliberate goal in mind uh, that has nothing to do with prevalence of truth, but everything to do with efforts to manipulate, undermine, destroy people's character, undermine them. I think it's atrocity propaganda is the, the older way of looking at it, which is you have someone you dislike or yours your opponent, and you deliberately, I'm not saying this is like, oh, you know, mistaken impression. I thought that she really was a pedophile, running a pedophile wing. It's like you, you know, make up, you sit in a room and you decide, okay, what would damage this person? And then you come up with something. Sometimes there's a shade of truth to it to try to make it worse. But that, that's what I think it is. And when it's that extreme, um, in some ways it's obvious. Sometimes there's this thing, well, you know, a little bit like, you credit, I don't mean this a bad way, but sometimes you can say, oh, it's so blurry, maybe people have different opinions. There's a difference between that, where people have different opinions, and, you know, I thought this case should have gone that way, and stuff where people are deliberately targeting uh, individuals with, with made-up malicious lies to try to destroy their character. Basically, the essence of defamation. And that's what I think is the, the core of fake news. Stuff deliberately invented for propagandic effect. Uh, that's one way of putting it, because it can go broader into lying about entire situations and not just individuals. Deliberate lies. That's fake news. We're out of time. So thank you very much for your questions. I appreciate your attention.